Hi, I'm George Crump, lead analyst with Stored Switzerland. We are at Supercomputing 2018 in Dallas, Texas. Uh, one of the subjects that comes up a lot here is the role of object storage as it relates to HPC. And specifically, can object storage evolve and be used uh, in production and workloads to replace parallel file systems? Joining me uh, to discuss that is Tony Barbagallo. He is the CEO with Coringo. Tony, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, George. So let's jump into this. Uh, what, what do you see the role of object storage in HPC? Sure. Well, you know, um, traditionally object storage has been used as kind of a secondary storage to store, say, the raw data for large analytics operations. But it was a great place to keep that growing amount of data. Your typical uh, workloads, um, there's, there's really never deletion, deletion right. that goes on. And uh, then ma mainly because I may want to run uh, analytics on some data that's five years old, compare it to analytics um, or compare it to an analysis of data currently. So object storage is a great way to store all that right data. And but now we're kind of seeing a, a move toward uh, using it instead of a, one of the more traditional parallel file systems, right? Yep. Yeah. And uh, and I think the originally uh, Rutherford Appleton Labs had a concept of wanting to do this. Okay. Um, they were getting bogged down with is mix. this our environment you have drawn up there? Uh, yes, it will be, as okay. a matter of fact. Okay, Not, good. <laughs> um, they were originally getting bogged down with POSIX file systems and all the management around that. Okay. And uh, the team there really wants to move from POSIX-based file system to RESTful interfaces. Gotcha, okay. Mainly because they have a number of data scientists throughout the world that are uh, doing analysis on geospatial data, and um, they may typically want to come in over the internet as opposed to having to go with private VPN, et cetera, et cetera. So it's as much a simplification thing as anything else? Absolutely. Okay. Um, but the other, the other aspect is with S3 from a protocol standpoint becoming more and more uh, prevalent, especially in cloud-based environments, sure. uh, um, it, made it, much, it makes it much easier now to, if I could train my organization on how to use S3, I can run and build and analytics applications that just use that protocol. So now I'm looking at the same files internal to the organization as well as external. Gotcha. Why don't you walk us through what you have here? Sure. So, uh, the, so the theory, though, behind replacing parallel file systems with an object storage environment really had to do with removing the bottlenecks that are typically associated with object storage. And since object storage is using uh, a web-based HTTP protocol, the first bottleneck is typically around the network. Okay. So um, the, their first idea was to use a sort of a typical HPC leaf spine network with 100 gig top of rack switches as well as 100 gig um, main switches and the same up and down uh, read and write, ingest and egress okay. throughput. So, so 100 gigs up to the clients and down to storage? Absolutely. Okay. And, and obviously some clients, if they're out over the, the internet, they may not have that. Right that level, but internal um, to have that kind of uh, throughput with the ultimate goal to be able to realize the whole benefit of the, of the disk throughput. Gotcha. So the typical environment for disk is 7200 nearline SAS right. drives, and that's really what, what comp comprises all of this. Okay. The yeah. other uh, key advantage of using S3 and sort of having a bridge, at least with our solution, is you, up here you can, you can talk NFS or S3 to the same files okay. in the data so, store. So no matter how you're coming in, you could kind of go in with whatever you're comfortable with. Right, and the, the beauty of the NFS aspect, especially if you're coming from a POSIX environment, it creates a nice transition right. um, before you actually build your S3-based less, applications. Less retraining, all that kind of stuff. Exactly, right? yeah. okay. exactly. So, so with all of this in place, um, the, the real test or experiment was, can an object store actually achieve sufficient enough throughput so at least for read, for the read intensive applications. Gotcha. Yeah, and I, I think that would be a common like sort of conventional wisdom, hey, it's not gonna be fast enough, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. And so in this case, they're capturing geospatial data from around the world. Okay. So the data comes in, but the interesting part is to be able to read that data and do analysis on it. Gotcha. And again, the goal here is not having to move the data from an object store to a distributed environment where the analysis can then be done and then move the data back or the results right. back. So basically, put it there once and use it in place. Correct. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. And so, uh, interestingly enough, with this environment, and mainly because of the architecture of Coringo Swarm, we achieved uh, 30, if I could draw that up there, 35 gigabytes per second throughput for read. Wow. And, uh, 
And that was better, that was about 60% better than the minimum requirement that they had, that okay. they were looking for. Okay. So. So, that, so basically that allows them to essentially have a, a single store. Do they still have a parallel file system? In yes, the absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's for their more write intensive workloads? Yeah. So, and, and again, they're still in a transition period. I okay. mean, in an ideal world, he'd like to see complete movement from POSIX to RESTful interfaces. Because, uh, because again, the RESTful interfaces, I can start moving things underneath from an architecture standpoint, from an infrastructure standpoint, without having to disrupt anything from a from a management standpoint, administration standpoint, as far as the data scientists are concerned. Okay. So what were some of the key benefits that, that I guess this customer saw and, and you would expect other customers to be able yeah, to do? Yeah, one of the interesting things is most um, proof of concepts are done typically in a smaller type of environment. Okay. And then um, the organization, the customer will extract, well, okay, if I got this much in this environment, I'll probably get right. this much more with, with more infrastructure, more hardware. Sure. And, uh, and it seems that most object storage uh, solutions, they all tend to shine in those, in those POCs. The really right. question is what happens when they scale? Right, sure. So in this particular case, the proof of concept was a fully scaled out oh. environment. So they went all in. They went all in. <laughs> yeah. So in our case, we, again, we achieved uh, greater than their minimum required um, throughput numbers. And the, and the reason why we did that mainly has to do with a simplified architecture of Coringo Swarm. Gotcha. So we have taken what, what we like to call a more pure object storage approach. Okay. The metadata is encapsulated with the data. So there's no metadata database that has to be looked up every time. Right. Again, that can start bogging down as you right. get into uh, larger and larger. That's a common thing we even see on parallel file systems is concern over metadata. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And uh, as well as the fact that we don't have any front end load balancers or front end caching hardware required. Okay. Which again can also skew proof of concepts in smaller environments. And I think that's an important point. There is no cache in Correct. here, right? Because there are some other people that will put a cache in there and say, oh, here we go. Right, right. Yeah. right. In, fact, in fact, right here, as you see right here, these are representative of the 12 storage nodes, x86-based servers that make up the architecture. Okay. Now, not shown in here, there is, a, there is a gateway, but that's mainly for authentication. Okay. So you have to have certain privileges, obviously, to have access to the files. Sure, okay, that makes sense. All right, so Tony, you know, we talked about uh, how this solution, one of the benefits they saw was uh, streamlining file sharing, right, with the, the common URL. Uh, what were some of the other uh, benefits that they saw from that? Sure. I mean, first and foremost, right there, performance is table stakes. Yeah. And uh, secondly, this transition, again, they're still using POSIX today, and they probably will for some number of years. So the ability to be able to transition their scientists from NFS to S3 is also key. And a very gradual process. Too. Absolutely, yeah. of course, of course. And then I think, um, if I think about the, the remainder of everything else, there was certainly the ability to scale granularly. So if I say granular scale. And, and that's a I, big one too, because a lot of times, like, especially with like object stores, you gotta buy it like in petabyte chunks, it feels like, right? So the ability to go very small is, is big. Absolutely, right? and, and they might have a grant that says that they only can fill up, they only have enough disk space to fill up half a, half a server. Good point. So I can do that with, with Swarm. Okay. And right. just buy the, the capacity for those servers. Okay. And also, no client software. So if you think about having to install some kind of driver on each of these clients, you know, that's just, that, you don't do that. Right. So yep. that's, again, a huge simplification from a management standpoint. Absolutely, especially because a lot of these environments have a lot of clients, right? Right, right. And then I think probably uh, what tends to go unnoticed, at least by the data scientists, but not certainly by the administrators of this whole infrastructure, is to do with the authentication management. Okay. So if I can, if I can for instance, share a URL for 24 hours, that's, that's all doable in the object storage environment. Gotcha. Okay, great. So, yeah, so I would say uh, authentication management. Okay. MGMT, there. That would be that would be probably the last the last one that I can think of. Okay, I mean that, those are some pretty big takeaways. Mm -hmm. So thanks very much for joining us today. Tony. All right, thank you. So there you have it. If you're looking to really kind of expand the the use of Object Store in the HPC environment, this gives you a really good example of how it can be used in uh, write once, read many type of uh, workloads, potentially replacing uh, parallel file systems. I'm George Crump, lead analyst with Storage Switzerland. Thank you for joining us.